Well, Fantastic. hello everybody. I see that there is already people joining us. Welcome everybody. Here we are ready for this seminar. We're gonna go to start joining us. Hello from New York, Sisto Acosta. Hello from uh, South Florida, that's where I am. I'm not in Jerez, but I'm from Jerez, but welcome, Sisto. Oliver, did you forget yeah. where you were? Sorry? Did you forget where you were? Uh, kind of. <laughs> no, and actually, I'm lucky enough to see the, the water from my, from my balcony, so I can see that um, the weather here in South Florida is, is super cold, so... We are not that far, let's say. That's right. But everything that I have around is like being in a cherry winery. So I feel like home. Alfred, were you born in Jerez? Yes, I'm born and raised in, in Jerez. I'm actually, uh, my family, my aunt and my grandfather were working in the company. So I'm kind of third generation of my family that has been working in the company. So hopefully I can do as them and, and, and be the whole life together because it's something that I enjoy working in Gonzalez Diaz and, and with the Sherry is such a pleasure. That's so cool. I've never been to Jerez proper, but I've been to um, Malaga and C Cordoba. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they grow, <clears throat> they do uh, PX very close to, to uh, they do a lot of Pedro Jimenez, yes, from that neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. In the area of Montilla Moriles in Cordoba, as you very well said, it's where, where they also produce uh, four to five wines. Uh, the Montilla Moriles is the denomination of origin. Um, there are some similarities in between the Sherry's and the Montilla uh, Moriles wine. Each one have then obviously some different. But yeah, yeah in the south of Spain, it's uh, a few areas to produce wine. And it's, an, in my opinion, a very cool area to be because the gastronomy, the culture, uh, the wines, obviously, the weather. It is, uh, yeah, I look forward to be back at least for a few days to visit Spain because I obviously really like it and, and miss it at some point. Cordoba was one of the most magical trips I've ever been on in my life. It blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. I That's want to go to it's, 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 uh, it's, it's one of my favorites in the South of Cordoba because so the, the, the astronomy, the culture, everything around is super beautiful uh, place. Go in July or August, that could be super hot. <laughs> but outside of that, it's, uh, it's a spectacular. Just kidding, Cordoba and Andalucía, it's, it's worth to go. And definitely, next time that you are around the South, you have a mandatory stop at Bodegas Tio Pepe, where you will be welcome. Uh, I obviously extend the invitation to everybody that is joining us and, and here interacting with us in the chat. Yeah, uh, so um, we just got Yancey Violi, I see, joined the, joined the uh, party. Uh, very excited. Uh, um, Yancey is a phenomenal bartender and friend from New York that is now living in Portland, of all places, um, you know, where there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of action happening right now, and I'm glad to hear he's keeping safe. Great. Great to have Yancey here, definitely. Yeah, I see that the participant people that is joining me is Kevin Christian. So we still give a few minutes before we start because we have a lot of things to talk about, right? And then a lot of beautiful cocktails to be, to be performed by, by you. We look forward to see them. Yeah, we're warming up. I guess that hopefully people that is joining us it has something to, to have this uh, way uh, pleasant, right? As a, as a glass of cherry or a cocktail or something would be great. Yeah. Um, so we have New York here. Um, you, we have Miami with you. We have yeah. Oregon with the ANSI. So now we've got like three of the four corners almost of the United States. Do you have anybody in California yet? Anybody from California? Yeah, it would be great and we, and we open it. I share this seminar as well with some of my friends uh, outside the country, also in, in Mexico and some other places uh, in Europe, although it's a little bit late in Europe, but hopefully they can, they can join us from everywhere they are, because I think that it will be really interesting what we're gonna see today here. Yeah, fantastic. And um, uh, you are, Alvaro, you're able to, to see the chat, right? You're good with being able to read the questions and stuff? Yeah, definitely. I have it here next to me. That's what I'm constantly looking to the right. So if somebody sees that it's a bit weird, 
that's the reason I have my laptop on my right side and I can read any question, any comment, anything that you guys want to share with us is more than welcome. Um, during the presentation, feel free to just send a question or a comment because either the cocktails, uh, the sherries or whatever, we'll be super happy to, to have interaction and to make this uh, super interesting for, for all of us. Very cool. Well, we're at um, 5.06. Matt Khoury, I can see your, your chat uh, messages when you, when you text. Do you want us to, to set this ship off to sea or, uh, or give people a few more minutes? Ready to go when you are. All right, that's good enough for me. <clears throat> so if everybody can hear me, uh, my name is Eamon Rocky. I am a uh, proud uh, uh, affiliate, supporter, lover, and friend of the New York Cocktail Expo. I've been uh, fortunate and honored to be the head judge uh, for the last several years, um, seeing it grow and, and develop in its scope and also professionalism and, um, and uh, really sort of become a moving force in, in the countries. Uh, soon to be the world, no doubt, uh, but the, the country's uh, cocktail scene has been a real honor. So uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to Matt for continuing to, uh, to ask me back. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here presenting with Alvaro Plata of uh, Luzolas Bayas today about sherry and, and what to do with it in cocktails. Um, I, I want to just uh, sort of give a touch of background on myself. Um, I've been a New York uh, bar guy, spirits guy, uh, opened a few restaurants and bars for the last several years. Uh, and uh, relatively recently, I released my own spirit. It's called Rockies. Uh, it is a liqueur, all natural, delicious, and uh, a wonderful accompaniment to virtually any spirit. And sherry is no, uh, no exception. So I'll give us some examples of what to do with the two of our spirits together, the world of sherry and also my own stuff, Rockies. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, please do ask questions. My computer is a little far away from me right now so that I can make some drinks here. Uh, but I think Alvaro has a good setup there so that he can both broadcast and also receive questions, comments, feedback of all kinds. Uh, so please, if you have a question for any, for myself, for, for Alvaro, uh, or for the, um, the Cocktail Expo in general, please uh, reference your questions to, to Alvaro. He'll be able to answer them and voice them on behalf of the group. Um, now, with that said, I'll hand this over to him so that he can get a bit of intro uh, for himself and for um, and for the sherry that he'll, he'll be representing, as you heard, he's a multi generation sherry lover um, and especially with Gonzalez Bias. Oh, one last thing: if you didn't receive the recipes that were sent out this morning uh, on behalf of the expo, it's no big deal. Just please, right now, email nycocktailexpo at gmail .com, and Matt Curry, the founder himself, will be receiving that email and sending out the recipes to anybody who missed them. So again, if you need the recipes for these cocktails, uh, just email nycocktailexpo at gmail.com and you'll get the uh, recipes right away. Without further ado, Oliver Platt. Perfect, thank you very much, Simon. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, for you on behalf of Gonzalez uh, B as you say, on behalf of Tio Pepe. Uh, I would like to obviously make a quick introduction. So all of our friends that are joining us, that I, I say hello from here in South Florida, uh, to all of them for this exciting uh, afternoon that we are having, because we will discover, as you very well said, that Sherry, which is known by everybody, but sometimes is not very clear how to maximize the Sherry, how to use it, is a wine, but it also can be performing in cocktails in a super good way. And I'm sure that today we are going to be lucky to see all the creation that you have done around the different types, because that's another important part. When people say, I know Sherry, this is a sweet, uh, sweet wine, uh, it's a dry wine, it's in between, it's everything. That's actually the beauty and the variety of character that we can find here. About my Myself quickly, Alvaro. Um, I was born in Jerez de la Frontera in the south of Spain in the Sherry area, as uh, you can imagine because of the name of Jerez. Uh, I've been working with for the last brand ambassador in this, and then I moved to the other side of the ocean to Americas, uh, doing the same role in this case, the different markets uh, located here in the US, in South Florida, as I said, in the sunny Miami. I'm very excited to share with you the passion of a family company that after 185 years and five generations 
they keep developing what our uh, founder back in the days of Manuel Maria Gonzalez was starting, the dream, the idea that we wanted to achieve. And with a lot of work, passion, uh, knowledge, uh, and, and effort, this family has uh, been able to do it. This company, as I said, was started in the south of Spain at the beginning of the 19th century. It was in 1835. Pio Pepe, which will be one of the start of the show today, is it's a wine that for us is an icon, is our flagship, is, is our DNA, because it was in 1844 when, we was, when this wine was born, being the first Fino sherry that then we will go through a different types of sherry wines. It was the first one to be expert in the history of the sherry area and the sherry category. And this is very special for us because now has uh, reached more than 150 15 countries that Pio Pepe is present is consumed, is going, and our biggest effort is to express, to transmit the tradition, the way of enjoying the wine, how to maximize the wine, because we know for some time the share, there is a list of the run. And we want to make it in the easiest way, combined with food in a very chilled temperature. You see that my Pio Pepe and my driver Mut is here on ice, and we'll go through all these uh, details during the presentation. That being said, this is more introduction about the, what we are, Gonzalez Villas and Bodegas Tio Pepe. You may know that sherry is a diversified category. But first of all, what I normally try to focus is that what is the sherry? That's the open question. Some people may think, well, that's a distilled product. It is a vermouth, it's an aperitif, it is a wine. It's actually a fortified wine, which means that it's born out of the grapes as a wine. But during the production process, after the fermentation, the wine will have an addition of pure alcohol coming from grapes in order to raise a little bit of alcohol content and start the long time aging that the sherry will spend in our beautiful cellars in Jerez de la Frontera for 5, for 10, 15, 20, even 50 years of aging. When the winemaker and his team will be able to follow up and to chase all this long time in order to achieve these wines with intensity, with character, flavors, aromas, which is the sherry about. So that's very important to have clear. The sherry is a fortified wine and we need to treat it like that. We need to maintain in good temperature. We need to store it the sherry properly. We need to use a wine glass to enjoy it. We need to put it to plain cocktail. We need to consider this uh, one ingredient uh, in the cocktail making but also the respect of a wine being one of the oldest region of Spain and of Europe where the wine was started to be produced. Get it. Today, with different types. Or we can have very dry sherry as our Pio Pepe. We can have dry sherries as Oloroso, Alfonso. We can have dry sherries as Palo Cortado, Leonor. But also we can have sweet sherry, which is coming through the combination of dry and sweet as for example, Solera, 1847, which is Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez, or we could have also very sweet style of wines as the Pedro Jimenez. There is main, the main types of sherry are 10, and this is absolutely uh, open, it's different, it's a big variety that will make that you can find a moment, a cocktail, a food pairing, uh, a situation to enjoy the different type of sherry which is closer to your preference, to your flavor, apple, whatever you like. If any question, obviously, during the presentation, uh, feel free to, to send those, uh, those questions. That being said, I think that even we can start to move into a bit more detail, see about what is going to be each, uh, each uh, wine. The way that we want to present this is a very interactive way, so I'm going to be giving a few words about the sherry wine that is used in the cocktail, and then we will enjoy the performance of how the cocktail is made. So we're going to start by the beginning, right, with the Tio Pepe, with the driest, with the Fino, the Sun. I see here that Joel has been uh, to Tio Pepe, beautiful Sera, wonderful sherry. This is super pleasure to, pleasant to read uh, to me, somebody from, from Jerez. But yeah, Tio Pepe, it is uh, something that goes uh, to me beyond just a wine. Is the passion, is the, the, the effort that during long time, during five different generations has been done. And here in this bottle, we can find all this work that has been achieved during this time of aging. 
briefly, what is a Tio Pepe? And as you can see, it's pretty chill here. Just took it out from the bucket in order to have the perfect temperature. This is a type of sherry that is called Fino. We need to identify that the name of our wine is Tio Pepe, but the sherry type, Fino. Fino will be coming from one great varietal, which is the Palomino Fino. It's a wide grade varietal, obviously. Now what we do after hand harvest will be light press to extract a very pure, a very delicate, a very uh, special mass that will be the base of our wine. The wine will go through a complete, sorry, the mass of those grapes will go through a complete fermentation. So what we have as a result is a white wine of approximately 12% alcohol by volume with very low residual sugar. This is the base of Tio Pepe. But this is not how Tio Pepe start to age into the barrel, into the cask. In this moment is when we are going to make the addition of alcohol. Remember that I mentioned at the beginning that this is a 45 style of wine. So we need to raise the alcohol from 12 up to 15. That's the only difference. Mandatorily, we need to use grape alcohol to make this addition. When the wine is 15%, start the aging. Five years will be taking the wine in the American oak barrel. Uh, the Fino style will have a special process of aging. It's what we call the biological system of aging because there will be a yeast that is completely covering the surface of the wine and it will be protecting the wine from the oxidation. That's how you can find a wine with this very pale color, hopefully it's clearly seen on the screen, after five years of aging, this protection from the oxygen will not make any oxidation happening in our beautiful wine. The yeast that is interacting from the beginning until we take the wine out for aging will be the key point of what we find in this Tio Pepe. The nose will be incisive, will be pungent, developing some green apple aromas, some bakery fermentative nose, very pleasant coming through your, through your nose. A very dry style of wine. When you drink it, again, very focused on the temperature of serving. We will have a wine in a pretty chill ice bucket before enjoying is the best, is the best uh, way to enjoy this wine. To see that the wine is dry, has very low level of residual sugar and glycerol. The residual sugar where during the fermentation turned into alcohol, the natural sugar of the mast. And the yeast that I was saying before that is totally interacting with the wine during the five years of aging, it's consuming the glycerol levels of the wine. The glycerol is produced as a secondary alcohol during the fermentation of the wine. So here we find that this low level of both factors will make the dryness present in Tio Pepe. With a low aftertaste developing salinity and minerality in the south of Spain where the sherry wine is produced, our soil that we call Alvariza is a salinity minerality very present because of the composition of our soil. This is also present when you drink it. Having a long aftertaste, a wine that as soon as I taste it is inviting me to think to combine with some food, different tapas, fried food, different umami flavor, Asian style of combination, a salad, a pasta dish. There is a lot of opportunities to enjoy this Tio Pepe which is a wine that is 15% alcohol by volume, a wine that is vegan friendly, if anybody is concerned about it, uh, Tio Pepe is certified vegan friendly, and a wine that, as I said before, is not just a perfect aperitif, a great wine for food matching, but also an absolutely great ingredient for cocktail making. And now I hand it over to you to show us how beautiful could be a cocktail when you put Cheers. great I'm ingredients. So out of curiosity, Alvaro, yeah. um, so um, I, I was always, at least early uh, in my introduction to, to Sherry, I was uh, sort of confused by it and uh, I didn't completely understand the context of the terroir, but then somebody shared with me to think about the influence of very clean, bright, high acid, fresh grapes and yeast, uh, which is imparted by the contact with the floor in, in right. uh, the... Uh, in the Crioneras and also on the chalk of the Avariza soil, right? Because it's a chalk soil, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct, it's totally right. And so what I, what I thought was really cool is this person said to me, they were like, think about 
uh, sherry, especially Fino and Manzanilla style sherries, as very similar to like Blanc de Blanc champagnes that are highly influenced by yeast that are grown in a similar soil type that's really uh, old ocean beds, right? With, with all the, the chalk and the seashells Correct. and by acid, which makes them kind of perfect for uh, shellfish and oysters and uh, aperitivos, right? Is that, is that all fair to say? Absolutely. Not knowing entirely how, how much everybody on this call, on this webinar, uh, drinks, drinks um, sherry, um, and hopefully it's a lot more after this, um, that for me at least was really helpful uh, because I've always loved champagne. And then getting to fall in love with Fino um, with the sort of better understanding of the terroir was really, it was a really fun sort of connection from my end. All right. Absolutely, that sounds amazing. And as you said, it's totally these factors keep pointing the sherry. All right, so let's make a cocktail with it. Um, it was important to me that the cocktails that we serve today are, and we make today, are uh, sort of referential riffs on classics, but are also uh, kind of new on their own. You know, uh, it would be really easy just to make um, a bamboo cocktail, uh, which are delicious um, aperitif drinks. Um, similar to a martini, but using sherry as the primary base. Uh, but I wanted to kind of stay with that theme and bring it back to uh, proper spirit forward gin martini. So the basis of this, uh, it's more or less equal parts. One ounce of Tio Pepe Fino Sherry, one ounce of, of gin. This is a dry gin that I, that I love. I, I, I was introduced recently by Alan Katz and his team at New York Distilling Company, a local uh, distillery. This is a dry gin. It's essentially their Dorothy Parker dry gin that has been steeped with rose petals. So it has this incredible blush color. Um, if you don't have rose petal infused gin, then it's not a big deal. I can obviously make a really, really yummy cocktail. But if you have um, a store around you that carries uh, Dorothy Parker, or if you know of a good store that might bring it in for you, it's an exceptional product. Um, I love it. Um, and also an ounce and a half of Rockies. So again, just to give a really brief sort of summation of what this is, it's a spirit that I make myself uh, here in New York. I make it, make it in Brooklyn, actually. Uh, it is a combination of green apple, pineapple, green tea, black tea, and citrus. Mostly lemon, but a bit of orange and lime as well. And for me, when I think about things that are delicious with, with sherry and are delicious in sherry cocktails, I think about freshness, I think about citrus, I think about green apple um, and complexity. And you know, the drying quality uh, that I feel comes uh, primarily from the soil of, of uh, Jerez, uh, that Alvaritha soil. And for me, I, bring, I try to bring that balance to my own spirit by using tea, that sort of uh, complexity, that tannin and, and the structure uh, that comes from that combination of both sweet and sour and tannic ingredients. Uh, stirred with ice. Just like a martini. And in this instance, we're essentially using a combination of the Rockies liqueur uh, and the sherry in lieu of vermouth if we were making a traditional gin style martini, right? I'm going to go ahead and cut myself a nice lemon twist. For this also, I want to, I want to let the spirits really shine because we're using three exceptional spirits. Some of the best Fino Sherry made, a phenomenal liqueur that I take most of the credit for, and a great gin, right? So um, sometimes, especially when I started to bartend, uh, I got really into creating like you know, super long twists that essentially wrap the whole thing and I would express the whole twist over the glass and then drop it in the glass. And there's a lot of oil that comes off of those, of those ingredients. There's a lot of oil that comes off of those twists, right? So for me, I went with a coin intentionally. I'm not cheaping out on you. I'm doing it because I want for the, the lemon to ignite the flavors that are here and not cover them up. So one simple twist, one simple coin, wipe the uh, rim of the cocktail and drop it in. Very simple, very elegant, uh, quite a bit of acidity, acidity from the citrus here, but also from the, from the grapes, from the sherry, and that baseline of spice that you get from juniper and black pepper 
and that complex uh, flavor profile that the rose brings to the table as well. Also, I can't tell how well it's coming through, but the color of this is beautiful. It's really, really, really pretty. Ice cold, nice and bright, and light, not quite as boozy as a classic martini that would have kind of the inverse ratio of having more gin than, than the vermouth, or the vermouth character, in this case, Rockies and Sherry. Uh, so you can have two or three of these and, uh, and not feel quite so bad about it, you know, depending on how much it is you like to drink both your oysters, which is delicious with, by the way. What do you think, Alvaro? Am I doing okay? It's absolutely awesome, and I think that the cocktail looks amazing. I'm just, uh, the only pity is that I don't have it in front of me, but I have the recipe, which is great, because I, I can always reproduce it. But uh, I love the way that you combine the different characters, making sense in anything, obviously, uh, looking for a sheet, this, this balance, which I think that is great for cocktail making, that sometimes you find uh, cocktails that has been done, but not really focusing on, on finding the balance. And for that, it's really important to know each product that you're using, right? To, to understand what they are expressing and to highlight looking for this combination. Yeah, I think that it's a, it's a great way to, to enjoy Tio Pepe, uh, Rockies, and uh, I'm putting it this way. Looks amazing. So cheers. Cheers to you and to all of you. Yeah, I see that the people is following and, and enjoying this first cocktail, this uh, first, co first cocktail, which is just the beginning, starting by, by this beautiful cocktail. And uh, now we're going to continue. I don't know if any question about the cocktail or about the, um, anything that we have mentioned already, but if not, we will always come, come back. Because following what we have prepared, there is a little bit of, um, uh, let's say, I would not say that flair will be a good way to define what, I, what I'm going to share with the Venencia. I don't know if the winemakers in Jerez consider themselves a flair uh, expert. But I'm for, I will say that they are because uh, although I'm not good as them uh, as the Venencia are in showing this next tool that is coming up in the presentation, it is something very important for us because it is, as I, as I just said, a tool that we use in the winery to do the following, the follow up of these wines. What is the Venencia? What I'm talking about? What I'm talking about is of this that I have here in front of me. I don't know. And then you see in the is a tool that is divided into three different, let's say, parts. One of them is the cup. It's a stainless steel. You probably can see it from here. There is a stem, which is a optic fiber. It's flexible. And then there is all here a hook, which is the other part. This simple method is the way that the winemaker will extract the sherry from the cask and will serve the sherry with some distance. So they get some aeration in the wine, which is helping to do the nose tasting that they need to go barrel by barrel during the time that the wine is aging in the cellar. This is called Venencia, V-E-N-E-N-C-I-A. I think I did it right, if not, excuse me. I don't know why I decided to spell that word. I'm not good at spelling, not even in Spanish. But what is important is how to use it. Because I know that day after day, we see that some more people in the bartender community, they know what is the Venencia. Maybe they have seen in our cocktail competition, Tio Pepe Challenge or something, the use of this tool. And I'm gonna demonstrate that using it is not hard. It just requires a few tricks. And it will be the perfect serving of a glass of any sherry. In this case, I'm gonna do it with Tio Pepe. First of all, I would like to give a tip about how to hold it. If you hold as you would a pencil, is the best way to control the way of bending the Venencia. This is something that could be changing depending on the person that is doing it, but I think that this is the more uh, comfortable way to, to hold it. And another thing, when we talk about the pouring, is thinking about the throwing. I know that big part of the people that is following us today are bartenders or related to the industry. So normally, although again, the throwing uh, could be a bit open, uh, what you tend to do is to hold one shaker, uh, which is pouring the liquid, and then you move the other. In the Venencia, it's something similar. Uh, sometimes we see that people don't move the glass, what they move is the Venencia, when normally it's the opposite. It's what you do is to hold the Venencia and move the glass to get the distance. It is easier if you make it that way, actually, than if you try to move the Venencia. And lastly, before I, I show how to do it, it's the way of bending the Venencia needs to be slow. If you make it too quickly, you have no time to get the distance in between the cup and the glass. So therefore you better make it in a way that is little by little, you are bending the Venencia so you control exactly 
the speed of the wine that is being poured into the glass. Okay, that being said, I think that it's time for a demonstration because if not, a lot of theory, but no practice. So let's imagine that I'm in Jerez, that I'm in the Pio Pepe cellar next to Antonio Flores, our head wine maker, or anybody of his team. I just put the Venetia into the sherry cask. I extract with some, let's say, part of the yeast that you may see in the Venetia when the wine makers are in a real barrel making this sampling. And what I'm gonna do is just hold it, as I said before, hopefully it's seen in the camera. And then we start little by little to pour it in a, in a slow way. As you can see, the wine is coming into the glass. And when you just finish, you cut it. By pulling the Venetia, you cut the, the, the wine that is coming out of, of it. And you have a perfect glass of Tio Pepe. Is this mandatory to enjoy a glass of sherry at home, in a bar, in a restaurant? It is not but it will, let's say, um, highlight these aromas and will make uh, the, all the room where you are uh, super aromatic with this, uh, this Tio Pepe nose very, very present. So, well, this is the Venencia. I hope that, uh, that we can, uh, or people can find some of them. We have been very actively bringing Venencias to the market here in the US and trying to share the tradition because at the end is where we build everything that we do today is trying to bring for today what it was started almost two centuries ago uh, in Gonzalez Diaz. So this will be the Venencia done with the Tio Pepe. Salud. Oliver, I have a question. Yeah. I feel like you were kind of, um, you, you just like blew my mind a minute, a minute ago because you described it. I think you said that um, old school Venencia, uh, Venencia um, obsessed uh, sherry producers are like the earliest flair bartenders in the world. Is that right? Sorry, once again? You said that you're like the, the oldest flair bartenders in the world. Is that what you said? Yeah, well, I could say we, sometimes there's a lot of links between the throwing and the Venencia. And I, I, I said that maybe the, the, the sherry wine makers, they could be considered flair as well because yeah. what they do. And also too, like what, what's with you Spaniards and like the Venencia, Porron? And chocolate, yeah. like, do you just exactly. really enjoy throwing your cocktails and wines around? Is that the deal? Like, what's the, like, you like to make it a game? You have to earn drinking it? Looks like, huh? looks like they're in Spain. We always try to see, okay, let's try to do it uh, difficult. Let's try to make it in a way, because as you mentioned, the porron, also with the cider in Asturias, which again, the pouring is uh, super long. Uh, it's beautiful to see that those traditions uh, are kept. And obviously we, we try to maintain and, and do a lot of different events with the Venencia, but it's a good point. Actually, I obviously know them, but I didn't think that some of them are coming from the same small country as it's Spain. Yeah, I feel like it's like a sobriety test. If you can't get it in your mouth, you're not allowed to drink, you know? Probably, yeah, I think that as we like to hang out with people around the food, about wines and everything, it's like I would wait to spend the time huh, and to see, okay, let's see. How can you handle it? But uh, it's a good point that I will, I will take for, for the future to, to link that. And we have done it because it's true that uh, places like in Barcelona's uh, Boadas cocktail bar with the throw-in and everything, uh, it's, very, it's very close to this, to this technique as well. I'm sorry for interrupting. It's always great to, to see those examples and to link the different traditions that at the end, eh, eh, the Venencia is not just, eh, let me just um, uh, mention something that is interesting in my, in my opinion. Eh, I also cover the countries in South America and one, eh, one day I received a video that in a Pisco eh, distillery or Pisco cellar, uh, they have something as a Venencia, but the only difference is that it was metal. So it was not flexible, it was not bending. So obviously the Venencia is not a tool that is exclusively from Jerez, not at all. It's very typical and popular in Jerez. But in fact, we can see that in some, uh, when we go to the history, we see in some Greek paintings, a reproduction of uh, tools like the Venencia that they use to extract uh, liquids, wines and everything. So it's obviously that have a lot of uh, history behind and we, we are definitely pushing to maintain it and to spread with the people so they know what is, what is this. So is vermouth a normal uh, product or historically uh, traditional product to be made from, from uh, sherry? Yeah, in this case, in Spain, the vermouth is uh, popular. Uh, normally, the production of sherry vermouth 
it is interesting. Somebody, excuse a second, they said that the volume is really low. Uh, I can hear you very well, Iman. I don't know if you can hear me well. I think you sound great. All right, so if not, I'm from the south of Spain, so I'm happy shouting instead of speaking. You know that the Spanish people is very loud when we speak, so I can, I can definitely raise a little bit of voice. Uh, toward your uh, question about the vermouth, uh, the vermouth in the sherry area, it is uh, something that has been produced uh, since a long time ago. Because actually when you look at our recipe today, which is uh, the La Copa vermouth, what we did a few years ago was to reproduce an original recipe that we have in our company from the 19th century. It's true that we, during a long period, we didn't produce it. We are not reinventing a recipe for our vermouth. We are reproducing something that over 100 years ago was done. So that is a beautiful result that we have today with the range of La Copa. Right. I'm sorry, I was reading. Uh, yeah, I'm going to introduce the cover right now. Uh, I'm super bad at doing two things at the same time. Actually, I can't. So if I'm reading, it's like I'm, I'm out. Uh, we are going to talk, uh, Chandler, about the cream sherry I have in here. So let 1847. We'll see in a cocktail as well. Uh, so we are going to talk about it. And we'll see what are the uh, rumors about bad sherry, which is not. Anything is bad in advance. You can make it right or bad, but definitely I, I think that nothing can be, uh, let's say, defined as bad uh, as general terms. So talking about the La Copa Vermouth, sorry, I'm back even now. I have these five seconds that uh, my brain was frozen. Uh, this is the beautiful bottle that you also have in front of you, La Copa Vermouth, beautiful packaging of a label that it was kind of rescued from the original one which uh, as you know, in a family company, these details are definitely very important. And that's what we did. But obviously the label is great, it's attractive. And let's talk a little bit also about the liquid, which is what we, what we have here. As I said before, we had in our historic archive some recipes of, or one recipe of the original vermouth that it was produced in 1896 is uh, the date, if I'm not mistaken of vermouth produced in uh, Gonzalez Diaz in Bodegas Tio Pepe. Uh, what we have done is to make a white version and a red version, but only using sherry as a base. These will not be considered as a sherry. We have seen already that sherry is a fortified wine, but you cannot add botanicals, spices, anything to the sherry. You cannot add sugar, you cannot, you need to follow the restriction for sherry. But you can do a sherry-based vermouth, which is what we have here in the extra dry. What is going to be the base of extra dry La Copa Vermouth? This guy that we have here, Tio Pepe, is going to be the Fino base. We are not using five years old Tio Pepe as the base because as you have seen, the notes of Tio Pepe are very present. The pungent character, the incisive notes that we find in the biological aging will be too present. So what we do is to go a little bit younger base of Fino to produce the base of La Copa Vermouth. So it's an average of three years old Fino Tio Pepe in the base of La Copa Vermouth that will be complete during the last year with the six botanicals that we use for both versions. We'll have wormwood, savory, orange peel, nutmeg, clove, and cinnamon. The vermouth is 17.0 alcohol by volume. These six botanicals in total almost four years of aging, extra dry category with a low level of residual sugar, and I think that you can identify clearly the base of the Fino, but being combined with the beautiful spices that are coming through the citric part of the orange peel, nut, the nutmeg and the clove being present, but in a fresh way. Look forward to see the cocktail that you have prepared with this. Oh, that's my cue. Got it. Um, if I can just say, um, I, I was introduced to uh, these vermouths, the, the Copa vermouth, uh, both dry and sweet, by a really uh, wonderful friend of mine who, who had recently introduced himself to them and was just spreading the word and he was, like, uh, he was really excited about them. And when he said to me, have you tried uh, the Gonzalo Bayas um, vermouths made from sherry, the first thing I thought was, that sounds cool. And as a traditionalist, I'm usually a very uh, staunch traditionalist, I just wasn't as excited immediately as, as I should have been. 
And I took a minute to think about it and I realized like this isn't an anomaly. This isn't something that's an experiment. This makes perfect sense. Even if, even if there has been sherry made, uh, sorry, vermouth made from sherry for a long time, like if you think about the way that uh, French dry vermouth is made, you know, it's traditionally made in Marseille and it's barrel aged and it's rich with this uh, uh, fortified sort of bright, refreshing herbal quality or from Chambray where it's lighter and fresher and more crisp, right? And I think about what makes those vermouths special from the French dry style and sherry brings that to the table. Fino sherry brings that to the table. So to, to say like we're using Fino sherry as a base for vermouth, it's the most natural, beautiful thing ever. And then, you know, you think about Italian sweet or red vermouths and the richness, the warm climate, um, the, the spices and the herbs and, and, the, and the flavor profile that you get from Italian botanicals, and you transfer that to sherry and the oxidative sherries that are used to produce the sweet vermouth. Again, it just makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't you use the world's greatest fortified dry wine to produce the world's greatest dry vermouth and the world's greatest sweet vermouth? I'm not even shilling for the brand. I don't work for the brand. I like Alvaro and his friend uh, and colleague Claire, who, who uh, has put a, put a lot of thought and effort into organizing this. I'm being- He's watching, he's watching. What's that? <laughs> she's watching. Uh, she's We're following the. Uh, Hi, Claire. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, Claire. Um, I'm sorry it took me so long to return your emails often. I'm, I really. <laughs> but uh, I'm really, really meaning this uh, from the heart. I was excited to do this um, uh, collaboration because I really do think that um, the, the sherries that are used to produce these vermouths and the way that they have been produced is exceptional. And it's not. An experiment, it is something that is born out of tradition and, and really has a place um, in, in at least my bar for sure. Um, and I can certainly recommend them to anybody with, with reckless abandon. Um, so that's my, that's my plug for, genuine heartfelt plug for uh, Sherry Vermouths and the ones from Ponce Las Bias. So with that said, um, I, I love making Sherry cocktails that don't conform to traditional norms. Right? The traditional sweet vermouth cocktail is a Manhattan. The traditional dry vermouth cocktail is a martini. I love them both, but that is not where it should stop. Right Now, my opinion, uh, I generally tend to build, not shake. Uh, I generally tend to build and stir vermouth cocktails. Not, not always, but that's my, my approach. And that's something that you'll see for the next four cocktails, that these are built cocktails that layer flavor, dilute a little bit less because this is not extremely high proof stuff, right? And if you compare this to, to a standard distillate, right? Um, it's much lower proof. So shaking and aggressively agitating it is not what I'm trying to accomplish. So we have one and a half ounces of uh, La Copa dry vermouth, one ounce of Rockies, just like that. We're building this in a wine glass also I thought this was fun because every Spanish person I've ever become friends with uh, falsely believes, but earnestly falsely believes, that their gin tonics are the best in the world. Um, and so I look forward to doing anything I can uh, with Spanish spirits in general in a big glass. Because you guys are just super into the big glass. And I think that most probably you should get over it, but it's fine. But I love you. I love you so much. <laughs> Am I right or wrong, Alvaro? Am I right or wrong? No, you're right. Totally right. No, it's true that we love this kind of huge vessel, a lot of ice, a lot of everything. Yeah. Yeah, like you like throw a bunch of juniper and black pepper and stuff, and there's like rosemary growing out of it. It's it's really fun, but like for me, it can be a little bit too much. And it can be too I agree. A little bit too much. Just the way you poop on everybody else's gin tonics is is totally uncalled for, right? Yeah. So. Um, anybody who knows a, a, a true, tried and true, actual, sincere Spanish gin tonic fan, when they're all, all Spanish gin tonic fans, uh, talk to them about gin tonics, and I promise you what I'm saying will be, will be borne out as true. So uh, this, however, is not a gin tonic. I just, that's why I used the glass, because I thought it would be funny. Um, this is, again, uh, one ounce of guava nectar, guava nectar, beautiful color, uh, one and one half ounces of La Copa dry vermouth, one ounce of my own juice, Rockies, and just a little splash of soda. Make sure the can or bottle, whatever you're using, is really fresh and really cold because you're not going to add a, a ton of it. Again, we're not looking for a ton of um, dilution here. We're just looking for that little bit of bubble, right? So, 
we build our drink in the completely unnecessarily large glass over ice um, and two things. I love sort of playing off of the color. I think that visual is important. And I think that the sort of numbing quality, uh, the anise forward quality of Peychaud's bitters is really, really yummy, right? Nice. So we go uh, Peychaud's bitters on top, don't mix it. And one really nice lime twist. Also just soapboxing a little bit. I think lime twists are extremely underutilized. They're delicious. Uh, they're incredibly bitter. Uh, but in the best possible way, if you cut them fresh, they're awesome. Uh, and I just finish the top of the glass. I twist over it and then finish the glass with the twist. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can. You can see that, right? Yeah. That line of, really. The line of pink on top of the pink, right? You can't see the lemon line between, but it is in there and it is contributing to the flavor profile of the drink. The idea being, and I call this beach vibes, you know, it's light, it's bright, it's refreshing. I haven't stirred it. I haven't shaken it. All the dilution is coming from the slowly melting ice and from that little tiny splash of soda, right? We're not trying to agitate this. We want this to be like uh, on the patio or on the beach sipping cocktail. Not too much booze here. Tons of flavor, right? This is, uh, this is one of my favorites of the, um, of the drinks that we're making today. Cheers. Looks, salud. Looks absolutely amazing. And I totally agree with everything that you detail about the presentation, uh, the... The, let's say the color that it was the Pichot bitter uh, giving, but also it makes sense. Sometimes when the garnishes are not making sense or it's something that then you take out and throw it away, it's probably not the best way of, of, of making it. No, it's super uh, cool. That cocktail looks amazing. And the thin quality glass that you can see that is super cool. It's going to be same when you're drinking at the beginning and at the end. It looks amazing. Uh, it's that, too, because we're making sherry cocktails today and sherry vermouth cocktail. I feel like, you know, the approach of, and I do it too, I do it too, but the approach of a lot of bartenders is like, oh, I need to make a low alcohol cocktail. I'm going to just take the cocktail and switch the whiskey out for Oloroso Sherry, or I'm going to switch the gin out for Fino Sherry, or I'm going to swap something else out and keep the cocktail uh, exactly the same, more or less, in terms of the ratio and build. And again, I do that too sometimes, but with a spirit that has as much flavor and character as the spirits we're working with here, you know, you don't need to necessarily start exclusively with the classic ratio from my perspective. I want to build, a, build something around the cocktail. I want to build something around the spirit um, that we're starting with. And I, I think that, you know, this vermouth um, and the other, the other, the sweet vermouth that we'll taste shortly and the, and the other wines that we're going through, they deserve their own recipes. They deserve their, deserve their own their own cocktails that really champion uh, and build off of the flavor profiles in the bottle, right? So you're able to build a cocktail that isn't like, oh, we would rather use rum in this, but we're using sherry or vermouth instead, I guess. This cocktail wouldn't be as good if it wasn't for the vermouth, right? This is a vermouth cocktail, not a cocktail that uses vermouth, if that makes sense. Exactly, yeah, that makes sense totally. And I also like the way that you are, um considering uh, very well the alcohol content of the ingredients that you are putting in, applying to the method that you're using. Sometimes I've seen some cocktail making with sherry base, which is, as you mentioned, uh, is a cocktail that I love, which is the bamboo. But you cannot steer a bamboo as you will do a martini or you will do another cocktail that the, the base of the alcohol at the beginning of the cocktail is, is much higher. So it is important because it's great that sherry doesn't require a lot of dilution. So keep it that way in order to not over dilute the cocktail and, and lose part of the flavors. So everything that you were explaining, I couldn't agree more, but hello. <laughs> he was the one making the mise en place, no, before starting? He's been, he's my barback. <laughs> That's nice. You're lucky, I don't have any barback here. I have a lot of bottles, but no barback. So well, moving uh, on, let me check on the chat. Um, about the cream, the color is stunning. Uh, I don't see the names here. L, I think. Beach Bites, uh, Beach Bites. I love, uh, I love it, patio zipper for days, that's nice. Here, that cocktail in, in, in Miami with the temperature that we have. Well, I know that in, in New York, I guess that you have a good temperature as well now, but this is, you can drink it here the whole year because definitely will invite to 
to enjoy that. What was the bitter that you used for this cocktail? Anita is asking just to top up. This is called Peychaud's bitters. Peychaud's bitters is uh, most commonly associated uh, with the Sazerac cocktail. Uh, it's right. made in New Orleans. Um, historically, it's made from cognac, or at least brandy, uh, and is flavored with a tremendous amount of anise, or anise-like uh, things, like fennel, star anise, etc. cetera. Um, it doesn't have an intensely overt bitterness. It's not tannic in the same way that Angostura or other, other aromatic bitters are. Um, for me, Peychaud's bitters is almost numbing. And for me, also, that's why it's so much fun to use it with uh, absinthe, as you will you know, recall, is a primary ingredient, uh, or at least a very important one, in the Sazerac cocktail, because the, the antiseptic qualities of, uh, sorry, anesthetic qualities of, um, of Peychaud's and uh, absinthe in general are similar to each other, right? So, you know, you have something here that's sweet and bright and fresh and herbal, right, from the, from the dry vermouth. And when you add in the Peychaud's bitters and you let it stay on top, every sip you take, the top of your lip and your tongue gets a little bit of that Peychaud's bitters, and you're able to taste both the freshness of the drink on the bottom, which is still, by the way, it's layered. I don't know if you can tell, but it's light pink on the bottom from the guava yeah. and pretty, pretty fresh pink on top from the Peychaud's bitters. So you're getting the freshness of the, of the guava on the bottom and the, and the vermouth, but then you're getting this sort of oily numbing quality from the uh, Peychaud's bitters. That combination is super fun. That's right. Also, Chris Booth is asking, how will you contrast Peugeot uh, to Angostura? I guess that is referring to the classic Angostura aromatic. Yeah. I mean, so Angostura bitters is, is probably the most important bitters in the world, first of all. And secondly, is undoubtedly the most important aromatic bitters in the world. And those aromatic bitters are generally defined by cinchona bark and cinnamon and spicy, sort of like traditional baking spiced flavors and aromas. You know, some of them uh, are made with, uh, are some of them made with whiskey, others are made with rum in the case of Angostura for sure, but they're generally made with barrel aged spirits. Whereas Peychaud's, uh, I not imagine that they've aged this in oak uh, or in barrels after blending it. Uh, it is possible that the uh, initial um, uh, spirit base, the brandy, um, was aged in oak, uh, but the point is that you don't have a tremendous oak influence, and you don't have like tannin bitterness, right? If you drink Angostura bitters, which is delicious, you know, I wouldn't do it every day, but like it is delicious, it's tannic, right? Whereas Peychaud's bitters, it's not particularly tannic, but it does have traditional bitterness, um, and, uh, and they sort of bring bitterness to, to cocktails in very different ways. Um, for me, behind my bar, I want to have an aromatic bitters like Angostura, uh, Peychaud's bitters, um, the anise flavor bitters, and an orange bitters. If you have those three, you can make damn near any cocktail. And the rest is fun, right? Celery bitters and, and apple bitters and peach bitters. Like all that stuff is fun. But start with those three because you can do virtually everything you want with them. Great. I think that that's perfect ans uh, answer for that question. And, and I agree that at the end, uh, those flavor profiles are very present in, in these three. I like to use uh, both. I would actually hear on the fridge uh, them. So yeah, he's, uh, Chris is saying, great answer, thank you. So same that I, I think. Let's move forward for the next, uh, in this case, vermouth. Then we'll come for the last three sherries that I have here on my, on my right hand, which is La Copa Vermouth. But in this case, this is the red version of our vermouth, which is made with the same base or the, is made with the base of the sherry that I have here on my side, which is the Solera 1847 cream. We will talk about the, um, we got, we will, Aileen is actually asking how you pair chocolate bitter. Maybe we can uh, answer that after making the cocktail. So we keep the question. Thank you for, for it. So let's uh, just have a few words about this uh, vermouth. Let's uh, see the cocktails and then we go for the, for the questions. La Copa Vermouth is actually uh, the red version using exactly the original recipe. I said before that the La Copa Vermouth range is based on original recipe from 1896. In the case of the white, what we have done is adapt to the extra dry, but this one that I have on my hand is exactly the same portion of different cherries in the base and the same botanicals. 75% of the vermouth that I have here in front of me 
will be Oloroso dry sherry. We'll talk about the Oloroso in a few minutes. And the rest is going to be 25% of Pedro Jimenez natural sweet sherry. These both wines will be together, will be aging for eight years before we, are, we have the addition of the six original botanicals. Once again, they are wormwood, savory, orange peel, cinnamon, nutmeg, nutmeg sorry, and clove. The vermouth, it's uh, in total almost nine years uh, of aging, in between aging and the maturation with the botanicals. I just have it here a little bit on the ice. I like it a bit fresh. This is a vermouth that will develop uh, obviously different color as you saw before. In this case, the Pedro Jimenez and the Oloroso are dark in color style of sherry. The nose is powerful, it's intense. Start to show you the character of the base wine by the hand of some hints of dates, racing, the body of the Oloroso, the intensity that the Oloroso, the booty character, the influence of the cast, uh, like uh, these nutty flavors coming through, but also the cloth, the cinnamon, those warm spices are coming through in the nose of La Copa Vermouth. When you drink it, you find that the wine, will, the vermouth, sorry, will be smooth, develop bitterness, but at the end, not extremely bitter because the influence of the sweet Pedro Jimenez, there is, in this case, the natural sugar coming from the Pedro Jimenez, will make very smooth and velvety in the way of drinking. Very long aftertaste, you will see that either in your nose or in the palate, the flavor will continue to be present. And although the feeling when you drink it, it is a smooth character and slightly sweetness or, or the sweetness present, the aftertaste because of the bitterness showing up will not make heavy in sugary character on this feeling of this vermouth. So this beautiful one here will complete the range with the extra dry that we have and the red vermouth in front of me. So now we again looking forward to see how to get the maximum of this vermouth rather than drinking by himself at really uh, low temperature, which is for me uh, one of my favorite uh, way of enjoying this vermouth. Awesome. So <clears throat> this time we're gonna do a highball, right? So we're moving now from really primary, fresh, uh, mineral-driven, chalky uh, fino sherry into a vermouth made from that fino sherry, herbal, but still embodying that chalky flavor. Now to going to richer, uh, spicier uh, uh, flavor profiles, right? Um, and again, I wanted, to, I wanted to create a cocktail that uses this as a genuine base spirit, not necessarily uh, thinking to myself, like, let's just make a Manhattan. Because making a Manhattan out of this, making a Negroni out of this, making a Boulevardier out of this, it's, it's like, it's such an easy wiffle ball experience. You know what I mean? I wanted to do something that was actually going to challenge um, what we think about as a standard uh, utilization of, of sweet vermouth, um, because I think it deserves it. It's a spicy, rich, uh, highly aromatic, and wonderful spirit that I believe deserves its own cocktails, right? So we have one and a half ounces of La Copa Sweet Vermouth, one ounce of Rocky's liqueur, gives it some brightness, freshness. We don't need a ton of, uh, we don't need a ton of acid, but we do need a little bit. Think of this like uh, what would come from giving your giving your cocktail a little twist, right? Or a little wedge. So a quarter ounce of lime juice, not much, just a little bit. I just juiced it now and strained it so there's no pulp. Uh, and a nice cold bottle of, um, of ginger beer. You could use ginger ale as well. I like the spice of ginger beer and that's kind of integral to this. The spice of this is so yummy. And so going uh, to ginger and heightening the spice of, of the vermouth for me is a lot of fun. Um, also too, you, you may or may not, I didn't point this out, have noticed that with the previous cocktail, the, um, the Beach Vibes cocktail, uh, I added the soda before the ice. I'll do the same thing here. And I'm doing that on purpose, it's not an accident. Uh, I want to add the sparkling element before the ice because I want it to become homogenous right before I add the ice. If you add the soda or sparkling elements of whatever, after you've added the ice, you'll never be able to integrate it properly. Add the sparkling, nobody ever does this, I don't understand why. Add the sparkling thing before you add the ice so that you add everything together and then chill it. 
That means that when we add our straw, the first sip and the last sip will all taste delicious. Gotcha. Yeah, that way you don't have to move the eyes and, and sometimes lose the battle. It's totally smart that easy. You get me. Nobody gets me. You get me. Okay. Now I saved the lime shell, right? Wow. This is used to juice the lime. I saved the lime shell. Beautiful glass. What's up? Beautiful glass. Yeah, it's pretty, right? It is. Yeah. And I'm adding just a little bit, about half an ounce of uh, Mr. Black coffee liqueur. Not the only delicious coffee liqueur on the market. I really like Cafe Brulot as well. But I like that this one is clean. It's really clean. It relies yeah. on the coffee first and foremost. And so this means that now that we have our glass, right? We have our sherry, we have our Rockies, we have our ginger beer. We added a touch of lime, not much, a touch of lime. Uh, we've added our ice, you know, but it's delicious here and it's delicious here. So to finish the cocktail, we add a straw. And as we add the straw, we finish it with the coffee, right? Um, so that it, it all just sort of like melts down together. It's a really, really yummy drink. The spiciness of the um, ginger beer, Yum. Spiciness of the ginger beer with that sort of like complexity and spiciness, if you will, of the vermouth. A little bit of sweetness and richness from the Rockies, but not too much. Uh, the coffee uh, really sort of holds its own and brings, brings us some, some weight to the co cocktail, you know yeah. what I mean? Brings some weight. And I think also too, when I think about Spain, I think about coffee. I drank a lot of coffee when I was in Spain. And I think people drink a lot of coffee in New York. But you guys drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> And true, that's totally true. That's like, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement. You know, that oxidative caramel sort of richness that you get from, from sherry, from oxidized sherry, which is the base of this, it's a natural bedfellow. That sort of nuttiness is natural with, uh, with coffee. So it's refreshing, yes, but there's a lot of layers going on. Ginger, vermouth, coffee, uh, citrus and apple, and a bit of tropical fruit from the Rockies. It's a really, really, really yummy highball. It looks amazing. I love when the coffee, it's also in the cocktails, not in the, a bit of uh, this uh, dark spirit, like this sweeter style. I like when they are fresh at the same time because of, as you said, the touch of the ginger, the fruity character of Rockies, and the touch of the acidity coming through the, through the lemon helps to build that, uh, that fresh character in a cocktail with the intensity flavors of you, of you just mentioned before, obviously La Copa being present. But it looks amazing. There's a ton. After you juice this in one of these hand presses, there is a ton of oil on the inside of this, right? And so by pouring the coffee liqueur in there, the alcohol that is in the liqueur grabs a hold of that oil. And when you pour the coffee liqueur out, you're not just pouring coffee out, you're pouring citrus out. You're pouring citrus oil out. And that's now in the drink, right? It changes the dynamic of the drink entirely, right? That one tiny little move changes everything about this cocktail. And I also like, uh, as I mentioned before, and obviously it's happening in, in all the cocktails, uh, that the garnish, that it was making sense. And also it was a good way to use the resources that you have in the bar. Uh, hopefully if we always need to look after the, the ingredients, the cause, the sustainability, nowadays even more, I will say, because of uh, the situation. And to use that, that majority, 99% of the bars would throw away, you can give an extra use, making it not just something that, influence the cocktail, but in a fun way that you need to pour. And at the end, I think that people like that. And, and doesn't need to be something extra with a cost that then you throw away and doesn't make sense. So I love that, um, that part as well. Amazing cocktail. Uh, people really like it as far as I see here on my laptop. I was able to answer some of the questions here in the chat. Uh, also, we have a pending one that I don't want to forget, which I guess that as we were talking about the Angostura bitter, they have a question about the um, chocolate bitter or cocoa bitter. Uh, uh, how will you pair this chocolate bitter? Which type of cocktails will be, in your opinion, fitting better this profile of flavor? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the same way that, and I, I don't think they're the same, but they do somewhat similar things. Cacao, which is what gives us chocolate, and coffee, you know, they do somewhat similar things. The richness, they're both roasted heavily, so they have that sort of Maillard quality, um, that toasted Maillard caramel quality. Um, so anything that you're using, in, in my opinion, anything you're using coffee in 
to be able to, to either accent and add chocolate bitters on top of that, or to um, please tell Island. Oh, Eamon. Hi, Island. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Um, thank you. It's nice to see you too. Um, but you know, anytime you're using, anytime you're using uh, coffee, I think chocolate is, is a very natural layer to throw on top of that. Or to think about using like creme de cacao um, in lieu of the coffee liqueur, right? So you pull the coffee liqueur out and you can use creme de cacao, you know, depending on this level of sweetness, you have to watch that. And then you can even use coffee bitters just so you could see, you know, what the trend, uh, the, the um, inverse, what the inverse would be, right? Yeah. So I don't know if I really answered the question properly, but the point is that when you think about things with, with coffee, when you think about things with chocolate, they do very much the same job in many ways. And I would say, find the classic cocktails that work well for you and that you enjoy and, and plug and play with those flavors, chocolate bitters, coffee bitters, creme de cacao, uh, creme de cafe or coffee liqueur, you know, uh, because there's a lot of drinks out there that do, that do those jobs. And, um, and they end up being really, really compatible with each other if you play around with them. And you know what? They're all delicious with sherry and Rockies. Great, I think that it was a great answer. If not, obviously, Aileen can let us know, but uh, uh, interesting, obviously, those, those comments about this also profile of flavors that at the end, I think that in the cocktail making with sense, practically almost every flavor can be making sense, right? To, to put it uh, in a way and in right measure, I think that they work very, very precisely. Uh, now we're back to sherry because we have, they're not sherry, the Vermouth La Copa, but they are kind of cousins of sherry because the base is 100% sherry. So now we go for uh, like, uh, Leonor Palo Cortado. And I'm sure that a lot of the people that is following, uh, they obviously like sherry and they are at least interested in sherry. And therefore the Palo Cortado it is uh, one of those type of sherry, which normally raise more questions when you are in a tasting and when you're talking about the different sherry types. So let's try to condense a little bit what is the Palo Cortado about it, because we even make a movie about the Palo Cortado in Jerez, uh, which is, I think, that 90 minutes uh, movie. So obviously when presenting a Palo Cortado in like three four minutes, is not easy, but I'll do my best in order to have it um, uh, clear in the in the for everybody that is uh, following us and after the um, the presenting the wine and making the cocktail we will come back with the question so just put it there if we don't answer right away don't worry that i have a laptop here with me so we'll be able to answer after so we start with this uh, leonor because we came back to the sherries and we keep tasting dry sherry so obviously uh, when you refer, when you talk about the sherries, people think, well, sherry, sometimes is majority of the sherries are sweetest style, but actually that's not true because there is a lot of different types of dry sherries, such as manzanilla, fino, amontillado, oloroso, or palo cortado. Those five types of sherry are produced with the same grape varietal. It's only one varietal present in those wine, which is the palo vino fino. The same grape varietal that we were using for Tio Pepe, it's the one that we use here. Therefore, the next question could be, okay, why the color of Palo Cortado is that, is, is that intense, is darker, if it's exactly the same grapes? What you guys do or what you guys did bad to change the color? Uh, it's not nothing that we did bad, it's just that the sherry at the beginning when we cultivate the grapes, we, we don't know yet or you, you don't necessarily take the decision of what you are producing in the vineyard you will do that decision later in the cellar because the grapes are exactly the same. So what we have here is a wine that after pressing the grapes and obtaining the mass, is gonna be coming from the same delicate and light mass that we use for Tio Pepe. Until that point, it's exactly the same. We go for the mass, we completely fermented the mass that we are using, and we'll get a base wine which for Tio Pepe and for Palo Cortado, it's exactly the same around 12% alcohol by volume coming from this light press and very low in residual sugar. So when is the moment that we actually take the decision? It's right now. It's when the winemaker will decide that he's producing a Pino or he's producing a Palo Cortado. How is this decision made? Better said, how is this a step to guide the wine in one side or guide the wine in another? 
is the alcohol content that we are adding to the wine. In the case of the Tio Pepe, we'll go for an addition of alcohol up to 15% of alcohol by volume. When in the Palos Cortados, you will need to go over 17% of alcohol by volume. And why? What's, what's the reason? The reason is that in the Finos, we need the yeast to develop, the biological agent to happen, while in the Palo Cortado, we don't want the yeast to develop. What we want is have a fine and delicate base, same base wine that we use for Tio Pepe, coming from this light press, but we want to apply the oxidative agent during majority of the time that the wine is aging. So when we have this addition of alcohol, the Palo Cortado will spend 12 years, in our case for Leonor, aging in American oak barrels. In this case, same size, our 600 liter capacity, the cars that we're using, will have approximately 500 liters of liquid inside, as in the Tio Pepe, but the difference in alcohol will make that the Tio Pepe is aging in contact with the yeast when the Palo Cortado will not have the yeast on top. That is the first difference that you find when you just look of a glass of this wine. You see that the color is intense, is much uh, darker than in the Tio Pepe, and it is because Tio Pepe has no oxidation and the Palo Cortado, yes. There is a super easy example to understand this process of aging with oxidation or without oxidation. If I grab an apple and I put it here on my countertop, I cut it in half, and one of that half of the apple, I wrap it with wrapping paper and the other one not, in 10 minutes, the one that I have been wrapping, it will maintain the white color in the pulp of the apple. When the other one that is in contact with the oxygen is probably already dark brown color. That's the oxidation happening, right? In my case, in the case of the wine, it could be defined a similar process when in Tio Pepe, there is no oxidation, the yeast is protecting the wine from the oxygen, in the Palo Cortado, there is. But the nose of the Palo Cortado is intense, is powerful. This is what we call in Jerez uh, a jewel of uh, the sherry or uh, handkerchief wine, those vinos de pañuelo, as our Antonio Flores master blender and winemaker mentioned. Because when you put the nose in a glass of Palo Cortado, the aromas are so intense, are combining woody character, vanilla, nutty, uh, nutty, ar nutty aromas coming through, orange peel, elegant notes. It's like the same aroma that you get when you step into an antique shop, when this old furniture, these old wooden notes are coming through. And the sip, just a small sip, will fill your palate with the intensity in a dry wine, but different dryness that we have before with Tio Pepe. Because here there is no yeast, therefore the yeast is not consuming the glycerol that we have in the wine. It still will remain in approximately four grains of residual sugar per liter but the 20% alcohol by volume wine that we have in front of us will show a super smooth character when drink it with a extremely long aftertaste. Just a sip will retain the flavor and the aroma in your nose and in the palate in a way that I think that is spectacular. A wine that it could be a perfect wine for meditation to be combined with some meat or with something with intensity, with some cheeses, with a different uh, style, or as you can see, now is when I handle it to you in making an absolutely great creation, uh, cocktail making, because when you want to make great cocktails, what you need to use is great ingredients, right? So that's what we try to offer to people, the great ingredients that we have. Albro, can I ask, uh, because, you know, having been in restaurants and bars for so long, you know, one of the things that um, bartenders uh, and, and captains and managers and servers try to do is they try to collect little bits of information that really make a big difference to their diners, their bar guests, or, or just like drinkers to their friends, right? Uh, whenever they discover something that's special and cool and they want to tell a story. So um, when somebody explained to me what Paulo Cortado is, um, they told me about the oxidation, they told me about the winemaking method, they told me how it started as Fino, etc. And there's a, there's a tremendous body of information, the grape type, the varietal, Palomino Fino, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then they told me, but I have a cool story to tell you, that the barrels, right, they're laying down, right? Uh, I'm a little teacup also. Uh, but they're let, the barrels are laying down, right? And then the, and then the, 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 sh the cellar master, 
right, will go along and mark the barrels of pheno with a piece of chalk, right? And for pheno, Correct. they mark they mark the barrel as one line. One line is pheno, right? Correct. That's correct. And then whenever they're like, but this one's going to be Palo Cortado, they come along and they cut the line. Correct. Right? Okay, cool. So I thought that was just so cool because, because Palo Cortado means what? It means it's, a Palo is a stick or line, but better said a stick and Cortado is cut. Right? Because you cut so thought, the biological aging. Correct. I just thought it was such a cool story and I've shared it so many times with guests in restaurants and bars when I'm pouring the Palo Cortado and I'm just like, you know, I'm going to give you a 10 second story that just is really cool because when you, when you think about the, the sherry houses, right? And all these barrels are piled up and like, there's this, and in my head at least, he's, a, he's always very old, you know, and like going along with a piece of chalk and marking barrels. And then like, for some reason, someone says, this one's going to be different. This mm -hmm. one's going to be special. And they go along and they cut the line and they proceed to make a Palo Cortado, which is a little bit more rare, right? It is. It is. And actually, now that you mentioned that, um, anomaly, because cherry tasting, I've been now seven years struggling every time that I make a tasting in order to be on time because I was always 30 minutes over the time that they gave me. But I think that it is it's fair and, and I'm worth to, to talk about that story. Just briefly, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Because the, the best slogan for this wine is that this wine, the Palo Cortado, was born as a mistake. And in this case, it is something that is very interesting. The mistake was because this, this wine was not existing. When we went back to the mid 19th century, around 1850s, is when we start. Exactly, that's correct. When we start to see reference in our archives or in Cherry Area archives to uh, mention the Palo Cortado, this type of wine at the very beginning that they were happening, they were called Olorosos Finos. I know that that could be confusing for people that is following uh, the tasting, but uh, happy to receive any question because Oloroso Fino is kind of a combination of two different types, which is actually what was happening here. At first, in Jerez, there were two main ways to start the sherry. Either you go for fino, therefore fair pre first press of the grapes with an addition of alcohol up to 15, or you go for the second press of the same grapes with an addition of alcohol over 17% of alcohol by volume. That would be fino in the case of the first press. That would be oloroso in the case of the second. What happened when the winemakers, I'm talking about the beginning of the 19th century, realized that the cask that were supposed to be fino, were not developing the yeast properly. And it was something very weird. They said like, what is happening here? Because maybe the cast at that time, the fermentation was taking place in cast. So no controlled temperature, not the perfect method that we use today, obviously. It would be the cast, it would be the fermentation. Maybe the wine was longer than we wish in the fermentation. We add more alcohol, less. What's happening here? What is the problem? Apparently the issue is that from the first press that it was supposed to be a fino, the addition of alcohol, instead of being around 15, let's call it 15, 15.3, 15.5, it was probably over 16 because it's just a detail. And talking about the method that they use in the 19th century, of course it was possible to make a small mistake, a beautiful mistake uh, when, we, when we look back today. So those wines that they were coming from the first press were struggling to develop the yeast at the beginning of the aging because the alcohol probably probably was already in the uh, in the maximum that the yeast can survive with so that's why when they have the fino as you very well were, uh, were explaining when they have the mark of the line the stick when they went back to those cars the only way to save the wine was to say okay this is never developing the yeast because if, for any reason let's add more alcohol so we we stop any attempt to have biological aging and start the oxidative system of aging. So they cut the line, the palo cortado, in order to indicate that the wine is now in the same alcohol that the olorosos, but it's not coming from the second press. It's coming from the first press. That was the best uh, way to indicate it. That's why at first they call it olorosos finos, to say this wine has the same alcohol of an oloroso, but it was coming from the beginning of the fino. 
So that's uh, a little bit tricky story because there is a lot of information, hopefully it's clear. Uh, it is the, the, the Palo Cortado story. If it is not clear for any of the people the, that is following us, no problem. Never is going to be clear the story behind the Palo Cortado. When winemakers in Jerez talk about it, there is never an agreement about what happened. That's the beauty, the mystery that is behind this style of wine that, uh, that I have here. And I think that is, it was a great point to mention about it. So thank you for the comment. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, I love Palo Cortado. And I think that uh, you should comment if you can relate to being a mistake that didn't live up to the expectations of your older sibling. Okay, yeah. great. On to the next cocktail. Um, <laughs> okay. So this one, this one is, is actually uh, more of a, a close riff to, um, to uh, a clearly identified classic, you know, sort of riffing on a Manhattan style cocktail with one ounce of rye whiskey. This is Sagamore rye whiskey from Maryland. Super, super yummy stuff, worth seeking out. It is delicious. With one ounce of uh, Palo Cortado sherry, which we've heard all about. Such a good story. The best, for me, at least, I think the best story in Sherry. Um, Probably. Very good stories, to be very clear. Yeah. Um, one and a half ounces of Rockies. Again, this is a Manhattan variation. Looking for whiskey. Looking for vermouth and sweetness. We're not adding, uh, we're not adding, um, any other form of sweetness here. So we're getting sweetness from the Rockies and sort of between the two of them doing much the same job of a, of a red vermouth or a sweet vermouth. And you couldn't have a Manhattan style cocktail without something uh, bitter, right? And this is an aromatic bitters. Um, I'm choosing to use just for fun, for no other reason than fun. So if you have a question uh, about why I'm using this, it's for fun. That's it. Um, but this is a bitters called chuncho, amargo chuncho. Uh, it is a Peruvian bitters that I love using in, in other, in many things, um, but certainly mostly in Pisco Sours. Um, it is a really, really, really tasty bitters that I think is a little bit lighter than uh, Angostura. Um, and, you know, Angostura, if you use it here, it would be awesome. It'd be so, so, so good. Um, but using a slightly lighter um, bitters, I think, allows the other ingredients, again, to shine. Um, but you could totally use any aromatic bitters you want. We're going to add ice to our mixing glass. For all you uh, fancy bartenders at home, bartenders at home, I'm not using cold draft. Get off my back, all right? Thank you. <laughs> Good talk. Um, but I am using these beautiful, perfect cubes, perfectly clear cubes, uh, from Okamoto Studios. They are wonderful. Nice. And Shintaro Okamoto. Uh, makes probably the best ice I've ever seen and is one of the most incredibly talented ice carvers in the world. So, uh, you know, in the, in the last several years, there have been all sorts of, um, all sorts of um, uh, Manhattan variations, Cobble Hills and Brooklyn's and uh, all, all, of, all of the neighborhoods uh, have played on, on um, the Manhattan cocktail. I don't, I don't necessarily, I didn't decide to take this there per se, but it is a Manhattan variation uh, and it's on the lighter side. I do like to use an orange coin, uh, similar to the lemon coin that we used earlier uh, to finish this cocktail. Um, I don't want to use a huge twist because I'm looking to really showcase these guys, right? Yeah. First and foremost. Um, but it is a lighter, brighter rye based nonetheless, but still a uh, sherry focused. Um, the Amontillado, the dry Amontillado uh, is, is awesome here. And the, the bitters, the chuncho bitters, or whatever bitters you decide to use, uh, and the orange kind of bring it, bring it home to, to the, the sherry, to that dry sherry, um, and, uh, and sort of bring it to life as well. But this twist here, for me, is kind of like, it's turning on a light switch. Everything is already here, but adding that twist brings it all to life. Um, and and I, this is also a really, really tasty sipper uh, at any, any points in the meal. You could drink this throughout a meal or, you know, kind of after the martinis and daiquiris and all that jazz. Cheers. Cheers. Looking amazing, uh, the combination, the presentation. I think that sometimes a uh, cool style of a uh, glass, uh, clear eyes. It's a 
practically everything because at the end important is what is inside. And I think that that, uh, that cocktails, uh, that flavor profiles are, are super cool. As you said, a little bit lighter in terms of alcohol probably, right? Which is also interesting. Acid. You know, there's a lot of acid in Paul Cortado Sherry. You know, I think yeah. we are conditioned as a people, we're conditioned. I'm, I'm in the same boat that when you see something dark, you expect it to be rich and heavy and uh, sort of caramelly, right? But the fact of the matter is there's a ton of acid here, man. Like this is, yeah. this is really, really bright, refreshing beverage. And that's, that's super cool. There is a reason why, and this is uh, because when we talk about the Palomino Fino red varietal, uh, it's not very high in acidity, but guess what? There is a point important in the sherry. When they spend such a long time aging, they concentrate alcohol, they concentrate residual sugar, they concentrate dry extract, they concentrate acidity as well. So although at the beginning it's not very high in acidity, what we are happening or we are having every year in the winery and once again the palo cortado leonor is 12 years of aging is concentration natural concentration the evaporation is happening uh, majority of the evaporation obviously will be water going through the boot and uh, that's why the acidity when you go to all sherries uh, of course i think that after 12 years of aging in barrel is already an old sherry the acidity increase and keep increasing increasing and i like it because it's uh, powerful has a lot of body but as you very well said, makes the wine alive, fresh, has this kick of these 30 years of wine in Jerez, these 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, they are very alive for being a wine that has been over three decades uh, aging in the, in the winery. And I, I really enjoy that. That's why a glass of Palo Cortado, uh, if uh, for people who likes uh, lamb meat, for example, or any which is fatty, it's great because it, it is strong enough to be paired with those flavor profile, but also have this point of acidity, the dryness will clean up your palate and it's very pleasant taking with the food or obviously as you were explaining in the cocktail making, it is a, it's a great point. After discovering the Palo Cortado, for those who didn't know it yet, uh, I, I'm sure the majority of the people at least heard about the Palo Cortado, we go for Alfonso Oloroso and that will be the last dry sherry that we are enjoying today. In this case, what we have is a wine that is uh, coming from the second press of the Palomino Fino grape varietal. As I was saying before, there is a main difference in between the Palo Cortado and the Oloroso. As you can see here, the color of the wine is much darker than we can see uh, in the Fino. But it's very similar to the one that we can find in the Leonor Palo Cortado. And it's because of the oxidation. Let me just jump a little bit in a question that we had before about the oxidation, if it is making drier the sherry, why in any way? Normally the oxidation will not make the wine drier. The drier that you will find in the sherry will be coming from a different aspect. One of them, which is probably the most uh, important, it's gonna be the fermentation being complete. In the case of the dry sherries, you find that Amontillados, Finos, Olorosos, Palos Cortados, we can define all those wines as dry sherry because the fermentation in the wine is complete, therefore the residual sugar in the base wine, which is starting everything, is very low. But why the Tio Pepe looks drier in the palate and it is actually drier than a glass of Oloroso or a glass of Palo Cortado or Amontillado? This is because the yeast is not consuming proper residual sugar, let's say, but it's consuming a different component of the wine, which is the glycerol. The glycerol is a secondary alcohol producing the fermentation. So the yeast will have the capacity to consume and keep those levels going down. That's why the Tio Pepe has a dry character because of the residual sugar and the glycerol level being very low. When you go to Amontillados, which is an evolution of the Finos, the feeling will be similar because the yeast has been present. But when you get to Olorosos and Palos Cortados, as you don't have the yeast being present, you have a different character. So the wines will be dry because the residual sugar are low, between 3.5 for Oloroso, uh, 4 for, for Palo Cortado. But the glycerol is not that low as in Tio Pepe. So that's why sometimes the Palo Cortado and the Oloroso tend to be a bit smoother in the palate that you can find in the sharp character of a Fino or a Manzanilla. So that's actually the reason. So in this case, the 
oxidation will not be a key point for that. It will be more the, what I'm talking uh, about this, this production. Talking again about the Oloroso, uh, which is uh, what we have in front of us. Um, color is similar, but the nose. I normally tend to say that the wine is wider. It is the Palo Cortado was a uh, oxidated wine, but reminding you that in the past was a fino in terms of being delicate, big fine notes coming through. The Oloroso is not saying that it is a be better or worse quality for coming from the second press. The second press means that there is more character from the seed of the grape, from the skin. Therefore, it's giving a bit more structure-based, powerful character. So here you can find some kind of creme brulee aroma, this kind of burnt sugary character, which is very pleasant. You find the nutty character, almondy notes coming through, American oak, a lot of vanilla. All these notes is very present. Just to mention Oloroso in Spanish, Oloroso is the name of the type of cherry, means fragrant, aromatic. So it's actually saying that this wine is powerful when you drink it. As I said before, it's a dry cherry. It's 18% of alcohol by volume. It is eight years of aging. But guess what? It's smooth. It's pleasant. It's actually not aggressive at all. The alcohol is not something that will be affecting too much to the way of enjoying this wine. The aftertaste will again be very long, long, and will maintain this character very present. Strong wine has character to be paired with food with intensity, as we mentioned before. And we could similarly find some options for the cocktails making that will be close to what we have been seen uh, just right before. Because for this wine, as um, we have had a lot of options, we are gonna just present it, the Oloroso, in order to have clear, which is a second press coming from the Palomino Fino, addition of alcohol over 17% alcohol by volume, aging for a long time, in this case, eight years, what is making Oloroso Alfonso, the wine that we have in front. I don't know if, very, if, if there is any question about this, um, this wine. If not, we will move to the last one, but not least, which is the Solera. Please, go ahead. Where can I get one of them? Because I wanted to make a drink with it, and I don't have one. So sadly, we'll move on from this on to the cream sherry, but I want to, I want to try it. I want to drink it. The Oloroso, you mean? Yes. Where to find that, well, that's actually going to be depending where the people that is following us is located. If it is either in New York or in Florida or some other uh, state in, into the USA or somebody outside of the, of the country is following us. Uh, so I think that as we have given some of the um, emails or either our social media, which is at Gonzalez Bias USA, is the best way to do it. Because if you ask me right now to me, I'm not pretty sure to say where you can find it in different states. It's, uh, we're lucky, uh, lucky to have uh, practically the full range of sherry uh, most likely present in all the country. So I can see here white.com. But if any question, uh, either Chio Pepe Wine in Instagram, in Facebook, Gonzalez Bias USA in Instagram, any question through there, we'll be able to get it. And so we can see exactly where the person is and where is the best way to find it. Somebody come to Miami in my place. Everybody's welcome to have a drink here. I have a glass of Oloroso. Okay, so that being said about the dry sherry, let's move into the sweet styles that we again will enjoy a beautiful cocktail, in this case with Solera 1847. For now, we have seen, uh, although we have seen uh, five bottles, uh, five uh, different wines and vermouth, we have seen three sherries Fino, Oloroso, or Fino, Palo Cortado, and Oloroso. Both, uh, the three of them were dry, but now we're going to go for a sweet wine, which is Soleda 1847. We kind of tasted this wine before because it was exactly the base of the La Copa Red. But now let's taste it by itself and let's talk about it uh, by itself. Soleda 1847 is a combination of 75% of dry Oloroso, the wine that we just taste, with the 25% to complete the blend being Pedro Jimenez. Pedro Jimenez is a name of the sherry type, but it's also a different great varietal. So this glass will contain two great varietals, Palomino Fino, that will be the 75% of Oloroso, and Pedro Jimenez, that will be the 25% of the Pedro Jimenez. Briefly, although we don't have it in the tasting, what is a Pedro Jimenez? 
the Pedro Jimenez wine, it's coming from a white grape varietal. The production, the vinification that we made is totally different of the one that we made with the Palomino Fino. What we do after hand harvest is to leave the grapes, the bunches of grapes directly in low mats in the vineyard, drying for two weeks in order the sun will evaporate approximately 50% of the content of the water that we have in those grapes. After these two weeks has been done, we get the grapes and we go for pressing. Those grapes look already almost like a raisin. So in this case, there is a lot of sugar concentration in a natural way, just because we evaporate almost 50% of the water that the grapes have. The mass that we get from those grapes will be super high in natural sugar, and that is what we want to achieve. The fermentation here is not complete. It's not complete fermentation as before. It's the opposite. We stop it as soon as we can in order to maintain the natural sugar and to be able to produce a super uh, high in sugar wine, super not in a bad way. Obviously, it will be around 385 grains of residual sugar per liter, but all the, nat the sugar are natural. We are not having any addition of sugar. The wine will be thick uh, with this density that is velvety, silky, racing, fix, everything that you find in the, in the Pedro Jimenez is partly represented in the glass that I have in front of me. Eight years of aging, 75% of Oloroso and 25% of Pedro Jimenez will be blend after approximately five years of aging to have time by themselves, time separate to develop their character, and then together will be to, to achieve this perfect balance and this nose, which will show Oloroso notes, booty character, and nutty flavor, and nutty aromas, and then flavors in the palate, but the hints of raisin, the hints of figs. It's been a pleasant Robert, wine when you drink it, it's super delicate. Would you say that, uh, that this makes uh, uh, your Gonzalez Bayas um, cream sherry similar to like um, Pinot de Chirons or Floc de Gascogne or, or Pamo, like these sort of like in process or even very fresh partial fermentations or not even fermented beverages that are fortified while they're still very sweet with the distillate of the same grapefruit, apple, whatever? Yeah. Well, in this case, at the end, and we see that in some other fortified categories, uh, one that is very popular and we have it very close, obviously, to, is to where we are, uh, which is the port. Uh, great varietals uh, may be different, type of cask may be different. Sherry will maintain the long time aging in the, in the cask, the grape alcohol addition that we make, the base of the Oloroso. So what I like about the sweet sherries is that they may be intense, but I like that they are normally not over sweet style. I, I'm even talking about the Pedro Jimenez, which is really intense, but they have kind of certain freshness that you find sometimes because of the long time that is aging, sometimes because of the character that they develop, the long time influence in the booty character. You know, it could be a few different, but it could go into that profile, obviously. More dessert style of wine that you can do great pairings, you can do great cocktail making. Um, and that's actually what we find here in the in the uh, Solerity Team 47. Just before you make a cocktail, let me answer a question before I forget, because a question was uh, sent a few minutes ago about the, cher the cream cherry which is exactly this, be considered about quality. Again, what I said is, uh, is, is actually, a, I think that very happening and very present in different wine categories. And I don't think that there is any type of wine or anything that is bad, but mandatorily. It depends how you make it. Here, we're using the same base of the Alfonso Oloroso, and we are using the base of Pedro Jimenez. I don't consider that it's bad. You may think, okay, as something that is sweet, you can cover mistake it by adding sugar. Here, there is no addition of sugar. The sugar is coming naturally. So I will not generalize about the cream sherry being bad. It will be a type of sherry that depends how you make it. Could be super good, super bad. And also it could be depending on your profile. Uh, I obviously think that the wine that we have in front of us here is a very good quality cream sherry. Alvaro, there was somebody who asked you a question, but I'm going to answer it, um, uh, and, and then you can answer it properly. But I think I saw somebody ask if this wine, if the cream sherry is like jam, it is not. This is more like, like maple syrup, but maple syrup you can drink, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it is not overly sweet. There's still a lot of acidity and there's still a lot of fruit. It's like dried fruit, like dates, and, um, 
and dried figs and toasted nuts and there's sweetness, but it's not overly sweet either. This is a super, super yummy wine. And, um, and I do not believe that it is like jam at all. Uh, in fact, maybe this is like, like wall Madeira, if you're, if you're a fan of Madeira, mm -hmm. like sort of like, again, bright, fresh acidity, not overly sweet, really good. You could drink this with, with um, savory food or, or dessert or cheese. I think cheese would be incredible. Blue, like, blue cheese, I like this. The age of Diego with Mario or whatever would be ridiculous. Um, but that's just, you know, me conforming to a stereotype, which is true. Um, but uh, but it's, it's really, really, really tasty. It's not, it's not like jam. It's certainly not. All right, should I be making a cocktail? Yes, okay, cool. I think so, no? Okay. They have a golden finish uh, in this uh, presentation. Okay. So I, I had this ceramic mug in my tea mug, tea, tea cup, tea cup, in my freezer uh, for, for uh, the last 24 hours. And I, I did this because A, it's really good for the cocktail, and B, because I wanted to, to express again something that I spoke about earlier. Uh, with sherry cocktails for me, I try to find ways to dilute uh, minimally and to chill so that it doesn't hurt the integrity of the spirit, right? So if I can use my glass, my cup, right, to make the cocktail cooler and to avoid diluting the cocktail too much from the ice, then great. Because this isn't a distillate, right? This is not a high proof distillate that can really take a pounding from dilution. Rather, it's a relatively moderate um, uh, wine, fortified wine, but nonetheless a wine uh, that you have to be really gentle with in many ways, I think. So uh, we're gonna go right into the glass. One ounce of the cream sherry. One ounce of Rockies, which is creamy and delicious. And um, because I also am fond of sort of thematic wordplay, nigori sake, right? So we have cream sherry, creamy sake, finished with cream soda. It is so fucking good. Can I say fucking? Is that okay, Matt? Yeah, it's fine. Yes. So, thanks, Laura. So that's why I called it Trace Leches, right? So we have cream soda, American cream soda, creamy sake, and cream sherry, right? That is brightened up and freshened up by Rockies. Chilled exclusively by the glass, and one big ass piece of ice, right? Nice. So the idea is that you're getting the intensity of all three of these ingredients, each of them is rich and round and creamy on their own, right? There's vanilla and there's sort of like a softness and a soft tart tanginess of the Nigori sake. Um, there's a caramel, nutty, sort of dark fruit quality of the cream sherry. And then you get a little bit of acidity, right? From, from the Rockies liqueur. That's the idea here. And we serve it in a really big ass, thick, ceramic cold mug, right? Uh, that preserves the carbonation, right? Because we added the carbonation before the ice in the glass. We don't add, we don't shake it, we don't stir it, right? We just let it be cold in the very thick glass. We add a big ass piece of ice, right? That keeps it cold and it is just a delicious way to finish uh, the way that cream sherry was designed to finish. At the end of a meal, with some cheese or with some, you know, dried fruit, right? That's the way this goes. Wow. With some chocolate, so we have some chocolate or with an espresso, right? That's the idea. This is how we're designed or we're intended to, in my opinion, at least in my experience, to, to sip this kind of wine. Um, and that was the, the sort of uh, the ethos that I wanted to capture here with three different creamy things that would really be a beautiful end to an incredible presentation. I think it's great. Looks absolutely amazing. Cheers. It's awesome. 
so good. Fresh, uh, I, I, I can imagine because the combination of the flavors, it's uh, great. And also the way of serving where the first sip and the last one will taste exactly the same is absolutely important. Ivo, we got a question uh, which I like, uh, um, may you, about sherry and matcha tea cocktails. Uh, and your comments on that, if you have tried already, uh, I am pretty positive in saying that this could be working. Uh, but I, have you tried with your comments about combining matcha tea with uh, sherry? I'm sorry, what, what the hell is the question? The question is about combining matcha tea and uh, sherry in cocktail making. Why not? Exactly, right? Yeah. I mean, if I was going to matcha tea, um, you know, I would probably go fino. What do you think, Alvaro? Exactly. That's what I was saying. Uh, I like to use in cocktail making that, uh, that I'm, I'm normally obviously close to, to, to the sherries, no? though we have some other products in our portfolio. Uh, I like the use of some teas and everything, which will help to, as you mentioned very well a few times during the cocktail making, the dilution in the sherry. It's very important to control the dilution in the sherry. And if you have dilution in the sherry, sometimes it could be by the hand of adding something which uh, gives flavor and decrease a little bit the alcohol, but it's not too much. So the tea is a good way to add water, if I may call it that way, but with flavor. So the slightly touch of this combination can be working very well in so many different combinations. So I totally agree with your comment that Obviously, why not? I'm mainly going to this fresh style of, uh, of uh, sherry when you go to this preparation. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, uh, to, to all, all of the, the boys and girls sitting at home listening to this uh, webinar, be good to your sherry. Be nice to it. Don't, don't beat it up. Don't, don't like whip it around in a cocktail glass or a mixing glass rather, you know, unless you really think that it's the right idea. Because I've done that too, and it sometimes is a good idea. But like, generally speaking, I think make sherry cobblers that are gentle and stir sherry into like martinis that are gentle and Manhattan style cocktails that are gentle. Build cocktails with it that innately uh, allow for the chill in the vessel or allow for the chill in the ice. And, um, and I think you'll be impressed and pleased with how much the sherry actually comes through and does a nice job for you. That's right. I like that. Sometimes you break down what you find in the bottle of sherry, which sometimes is not uh, that close to everybody's uh, flavor profile. But taste the fino, taste the oloroso, and see, okay, this reminds me to this, 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 and then you think about what can I build around that? Which kind of ingredient can give me the use, making sense, uh, having a, a balance in between the alcohol, the, the, the character that I'm using. And that's why our biggest focus is every time that we have these kind of sessions, which is obviously about how to use the sherry. It's also important to have a few words about how the wine is produced, how is the, at the end, tasting is personal. And that's actually something that each one will, will realize or will recognize flavor profile differently. But at least explain how the wine it is, what the alcohol, what the character to taste it. And from that, the building of a cocktail or something, it's much easier. So, so it is um, the way we like to promote and to do it. And I think, and I hope definitely, that that was um, interesting for everybody that was following us, at least it was to me, because although I was doing my part of talking about the sherry, it was uh, it's always a great learning to see your creation and everything that you have done. So from my side, before I handle it to you to close this event, if there's no more questions, which I think that we have been quite uh, dynamic by answering them, uh, just giving you thanks uh, because uh, again it's a great learning and those recipes can be a great base to use or an inspiration as I read in some comments for, for some other creation. Fantastic. Well, um, I just want to say how nice it was to work with you, Alvaro, and uh, Claire as well, um, who is, who is uh, I'm sure, watching and taking notes. Um, <laughs> thank you to Matt Curry, the founder of the New York Cocktail Expo, for allowing us to be a part of this great um, online, but nonetheless uh, present and valuable um, uh, conference. Um, and I would like to remind everyone that uh, bartenders, especially bartenders, that uh, the New York Cocktail Expo online is hosting the best cocktail of the year and Tiki to go down as opposed to three, Tiki Throwdown, which is last year, next year for sure. But Tiki to go down um, cocktails um, should be submitted 
And if you'd like to enter, uh, uh, reach out to nycocktailexpo at gmail.com. If you're some sort of uh, genius bartender sitting at home and, and looking to make your name for yourself with Tiki Cocktails and Best Cocktails of the Year. Um, and Matt will let me know how I can be involved in that too. So um, got to take, got to take Jello down and see that's later. <laughs> yeah, so big shout out to, uh, to Jello and the team at Osamil uh, for, their, for their win last year. Uh, they are they are the folks to beat, and man, I'll tell you, it's going to be tough because that boy is good with uh, with uh, tiki cocktails. Um, and anyway, to anybody who has sat through this hour and forty five minute presentation um, of of me making drinks and Alvaro eloquently speaking about sherry, thank you. Uh, please stay in touch. Um, I I would be happy to chat with and stay in touch with anybody um, uh, on this on this Zoom. Um, my, yeah, my company is Rockies Milk Punch.com. Oh, sorry, Rockies Mil at Rockies Milk Punch on Instagram. <laughs> but it is also Rockies Milk Punch.com. That's true. That's my website. Who uses websites anymore? That's, isn't that yeah. kind of antiquated, right? Who's been to a website ever? I mean, two. I can think of one or two. But nonetheless, um, thank you to Alvaro and the, uh, and the, and the incredible effort that he put in. Thank you to Matt Curry. Thank you for all of you for attending. And I'm going to drink more of these cocktails right now. Signing off. Love you all. See you soon. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. And see you soon.